Thank you for inviting me over to Great Biddeford. That's all right. That's right, isn't it? Small times in Great Biddeford, is that right? Oh dear. That's upset half the people already. Not a good start. Okay, I'd just like to speak over you this morning. Parenthood. Now, um, I noticed a lot of the um, lot of the parents actually gone out, so the rest of you are probably going pale now. What does he mean? He's speaking parenthood over me. In in the biggest sense of the word, biological parenthood, sure, but maybe grandparenthood, maybe maybe that you are um, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a sister, a brother. Maybe you're going to be a spiritual mother or father. So I just want to declare that word this morning of parenthood. So if you can think of that in the, in the biggest, biggest, widest sense of the word, parenthood. Jeff, they're all gone serious. They've all gone pale. This, this will happen. This will happen, fine. Okay, well, we'll plow through then. So, come on, let's have some feedback. I need at least a smile from somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So let's pray. Oh Lord, I just thank you that you have so much to teach us about being spiritual mothers and fathers, about being biological mothers and fathers, about, about being parents to children in our community. And Lord, oh, whatever it is you want to say about this, Lord, we want to have ears to hear. In your name. Amen. Amen. So, I want to ask you, do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a vision for your children? Do you know where you're heading and do you know how you're gonna get there as a family? Do you know what your values are? What you think about things? Is this something you want your children to have? Is this something you want your children to be? Just think about that for a second. Does Having a vision for your family include your family being children of God. Absolutely. Having a personal relationship with Jesus. This is how the Bible puts it when talking about Jesus. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He gave the right to become children of God. I just so want that for my family. I so want that for my children. I so want that for my grandchildren. That's what I mean when we want to pray, parenting, to speak parenting over us. We want that. We have to have a vision. I have to have an idea of where we're going on this. We need intentional investment. One of the things that God's been saying to us in the last 12 months is the word intentional. It's an interesting word, intentional, isn't it? Because, you know, the world so crowds in on us, doesn't it? that um, we're so busy half the time that it's quite difficult to be intentional, to have a vision and actually to intentionally want to invest in it. And I'm just praying and hoping today that we want to be intentional people who invest. You and I have to invest in something if we want to, want to return. If you want good things for your children, we have to invest in them and also invest in our parenting skills, or our grandparenting skills. And um, interesting enough, I am now learning how to be a grandparent. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of choice, actually, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't audition or anything. I was just given the role. Um, now, Angela informs me that the first time round, I managed to avoid changing any nappies at all. It can't be true, can it? She says it's true. Um, so the other day I was asked to take one, uh, one year old grandchild to Killerton, what, what could be difficult. Have you ever said, what can go wrong? What can possibly go wrong? Have you ever said that? What can possibly go wrong? Okay, but Angela wasn't there, she'd gone to a woman's day. A bit like, you know, these MOD things, you don't want to get out of something, you go to a woman's day, you know. So I am left with this child, what can go wrong? Well, there was an explosion. Do I need to? Do I need to spell it out? 
so, so I got to Killerton Car Park, I got an estate car, I sort of got all the stuff out, and I was just, uh, I won't go into the details, I won't go into the details. Needless to say, somebody from Grosvenor Barnstable drove past, waved to me and didn't stop. <laughs> I'm learning, you're learning, we're learning together. I think the thing about I think you can understand what I mean by investing. We're going to talk to you about investing, investing in prayer, investing in love, investing in time, and invest, investing in generational things. But what I'm talking about being intentional is that if you're not intentional, it's like saying, oh, I'm going to get lucky. But getting lucky often means the odds are against you. And did you know, and I'm not recommending the lottery by saying this, but did you know that the odds of winning the lottery are one in 45 million? One in 45 million. Those are people who've been telling you it's easy to win the, the lottery, the, it's fake news. Um, so I want better odds than that for my children. I want better odds than that for my children becoming children of God, for my friends, my family becoming children of God. If you want your children to know Jesus, this is not gonna ha happen by accident. You cannot hand over the responsibility to others. Um, don't get me wrong, the Sunday schools, the children's work, the clubs, they're brilliant, they're amazing, and of course it's fantastic that you take your children to them. But at the end of the day, the spiritual responsibility is mine and it's yours, and you can't pass it on to anybody else. You, you and I have to decide to intentionally invest in our children, our children's welfare, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Now for our family, uh, one of the things we did is we, we took our children to uh, the New Wine Christian Camp, some, some account, some of you have heard of it. Uh, our son David, who's now um, 26, uh, <laughs> oops, um, he went to the camp since he was one. Um, and you know, I mean, you guys, I think a lot of you go to Creation Fest, Creation Fest is an example of how you can intentionally invest in your kids, and I think it's good fun. Is it good fun? Yeah, yeah see? Mm -hmm. So you can invest in, and it's good fun. Because they had the opportunity just to see what it was like, what it was like to spend a week with other kids their age, and actually experience God for themselves. It was awesome, absolutely awesome. And <laughs> that's what I mean. Good, intentional investment. The Bible puts it like this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or the message puts it like this, point your kids in the right direction. When they are old, they won't be lost. So as I said, we're now going to look at some, some investments that we can make. And I'm just gonna talk about the first one, our investment in prayer. Hello everyone, it's lovely to see you all. Um, so, um, we invest in our children, don't we, by praying for them, by praying for them, for pray by praying with them, by praying over them, and then teaching them how to pray for themselves. 1 John 5 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So God gives us a way to provide gifts for our children. He invites us to pray. Why? So John Wesley, who some of you might have heard of, who lived about 250 years ago, was very much part of amazing English revival at that time. He said this, God does nothing on earth save in answer to believing prayer. That is quite something, isn't it? And if you read, and when the Bible actually supports this connection, doesn't it, by its, by, because God says over and over again, he says, ask me and I will. And then he says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, then I will. And then he says, ask, and it will be given to you. So God wants us to pray. So 
So a lady called uh, Jodie Burnt, um, and she's written a book called A Pray for Children Using Scripture. And she says this, As a mother, I've always prayed for my children, but for many years my prayers tended to run along the God bless Johnny lines. I'd ask God to help my kids in their spelling tests, protect them on their field trips, and restore their health when they got flu or ran a fever. Rarely, though, did my prayers get more creative than that, and almost never did I sense that they were really packing a punch. So, of course, there's nothing wrong with praying prayers like that, is there? God is interested in the detail of our lives as well as the big things. But she goes on to say, here's what I mean. Verses like Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And that can be reworked, she says, into terrific prayers for how, you, for how your kids treat each other. So I've been praying this, this verse over our grandkids now, three and a half and one and a half. So as a grandparent, I know some of you who are grandparents know that um, you're slightly removed, aren't you? You're spending time, you're enjoying their, their, their company, but you're slightly removed from the sort of the, the minute by minute uh, nitty gritty and the, the um, exhaustion of being parents. And so often you see things from a different perspective. <laughs> so I can see my two gorgeous grandsons or our two gorgeous grandsons, I can see the sibling rivalry there. So, um, you know, <laughs> so what I pray I pray that Jonathan and Timothy will be kind and compassionate toward each other, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave them. So our friend Catherine, um, over the years, has, has really encouraged me to pray scripture, and, and that's a good thing to do. And another, um, Jody um, mentions this, in 2 Timothy 2 verse 22, she, it's, it says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So for my kids and my grandkids, now I pray that they will flee those evil desires. They will pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And they'll enjoy the company of other people, of other children, who call on the Lord and have pure hearts. So Jodie says, not only are prayers like these more creative, but they carry the full weight and power of God's word. So in Isaiah it says, God says, my word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And the author of Hebrews says, the word of God is alive and full of power. So when we pray scripture over our kids, it's powerful, okay? So a few weeks ago, my daughter Sarah sent me um, a blog from a lady called Wendy Rogers, and it's 10 promises um, to pray over your children from scripture. And I just read, I'll just read one of them to you. It's a promise of, promise of rest. And in Matthew 11 it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And the prayer, Lord Jesus, I pray that my children come to you so that they can receive your rest. Help them to learn from you. And I pray that you are the first place they go to for rest. I thought that was a lovely prayer. So how else do we pray for them? Pray for them by going into their room when they're asleep. Praying over them in English. Praying over them in tongues. Worshipping over them. 
You know, if you pray with your kids regularly throughout their lives, from their very, from when they're babies, when they get to their teens, you have earned the right to go into their room. And when they're struggling, whether they're struggling with um, things of faith or they're struggling with things of relationship or you don't even know what they're struggling with, when you pray with them, you bring them into God's presence and you open the way for God to minister to them. So that's really, really important, isn't it? It's really precious. So we model and teach, don't we? We let them see us praying together with, with husband and wife, parents praying together. Let them see that or with a friend or friends meeting together, they know our, our children, my children knew that I met together with a particular friend every week specifically for pray, to pray for them and their school. Pray together as a family. It's said that a family that prays together stays together. Pray for healing. When, when your little one comes to you with a grazed knee or they bump the head, What's the first thing that you do? Give them a cuddle and pray for them. Pray for healing. Not that there's anything wrong with modern medicine and the NHS, it's absolutely wonderful. But what are we teaching our kids to ultimately trust in? Are we teaching them to first and foremost trust God? And then it's wonderful, isn't it, when our kids reciprocate. When you prayed for them and they say, Mum or Dad, can I pray for you? That is wonderful. About 15 years ago, I have, when our kids were in their early teens, I, had a, I have a, a very vivid memory of driving down to Exeter to a course. And on the way I was praying and God said to me, I want you to pray from a point of faith rather than a point of fear. Later on that day, one of our kids, um, one of their friends committed suicide. And I believe God prepared me to pray in faith for that situation because it was a very difficult time for, for our daughter. And then more recently, listening to some of Dawna De Silva's teaching from Bethel, she talks about her husband having a dream, a, a, a picture of three chairs. One was the chair of love, one was the chair of fear, and one was the chair of selfish ambition. And the question was, what seat do you sit on when you pray? Do you sit sometimes on that seat of selfish ambition for your kids? Or are you, seat, are you sitting on that seat of fear when you're praying for, that, for your kids? So when we're praying, remember where we're praying from. Remember that Jesus has done it all. He's conquered death, he's conquered sin, he's conquered sickness, he's conquered the enemy, Satan. So we, so Jesus is seated at the right hand of Father God and he's interceding for us and we're there alongside with him, hidden with him. And that's where we're contending for our children from, from that place of victory. So I'm grateful for the fact that my, my mum and dad prayed for me and my grandparents or my grandmothers I know prayed for me. Um, and my prayer for my children is that my ceiling, as far as my knowledge and experience of Jesus is concerned, is their floor. And that, but not that my ceiling stuck, I want my ceiling to get higher and to know and experience him more. But that's, what's, that's what I'm praying for my kids and my grandkids. And I pray that they will experience a thousand times more. God's love and God's goodness because he's such an extravagant, extravagant God.
The second investment that we have is love. We all need to be loved. Love starts with God because God is love. Oh, we have a need to, to love because that is God's design. He loves us and we were created to love him. He showed us his love by sacrificing himself on the cross. That everything that we have done wrong can be forgiven. He loves us that much. We just have to put our trust in him, to love him, to believe he is who he says he is. And that is love. Remember, the Bible says in Romans, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God is love. And he made us in his own image to love and be loved. He loves us and he invites us to love him in return. We love because he first loved us. So we have to intentionally invest our love in others as God has intentionally invested his love in us. And children desperately need to be loved. Children learn to love by experiencing the unconditional love of their parents. Uh, there's a quote I have from the, uh, um, the Nikki and, and Cedar Lee parenting course. And it says this, there is no power on earth like uh, the parent's unconditional love. And I think that if you offered that to your child, you're 90% of the way home. It's important for children to feel accepted for who they are. Our love and acceptance give our children confidence through building in them, building in them security, knowing they are loved not for what they do, but for who they are. Through building in them self-worth, knowing that they are of value. Their self-worth is based on what they think we, their parents, think of them. Through building in them significance, knowing there is a purpose to their lives and that they have a worthwhile contribution to make. But of course, ultimately, security, self-worth, and significant significance come from God. But we can model God's parenthood and represent him well to our children. So that's the second investment, love. So we've had prayer, we've had love, and now we have time. An investment of love and time in our children is one of the most precious gifts we can give them. When you think about what a family is for, you can see how important what we do and what we say is. So I'm just going to give you a few very brief points of what a family is for. A family provides support. In the world, you know, our experience, you know this, our children will experience rejection, disappointment, failure. But in a family, they should experience acceptance, love, encouragement. A family should provide fun, fun, laughter, planning special family times, eating together. A family provides a moral compass or values if you prefer. And children learn about good and bad behavior from their family. They learn values such as thinking about others, taking responsibility, Dare I say, helping around the house? Or is that just a concept? <laughs> How to handle conflict, say sorry, forgive. Consistency in behavior. How to communicate with each other. How to deal with electronics. If the children can't speak to you because you're buried in your phone, and when you speak to them, don't expect them not to be buried in their phone. Um, how we celebrate the positive more than the correct the negative. I'd love to just pause on that for one second. I, I kind of think that you need to have two positives for every one negative. I think that probably applies whether you're married or, or whether you're talking about children. But I think, um, I think two positives for one negative is a really, good, <laughs> a really good balance. A family is a place children will learn to relate. They, re they relate. They learn to relate by experiencing, observing, practicing various relationships in the family that we've talked about. And if you are not spending intentional time with your children, 
They're still being taught by someone. If you're not teaching them, who do you think is teaching them? It might be the television, it might be their friends, it might be the internet, it might be Facebook. But if you don't spend intentional time with your children, don't think they're not being taught, they are. They're just not being taught by you. So when Jesus was teaching his disciples, he would model and teach. For example, he showed how to humble himself, how to have a servant heart, and how to, to wash his disciples' feet. And then after he'd done that, he explained to them what he'd done. He gathered them around and said, hey guys, you know, do you realize what I've just done for you? And told them how they should do that for one another. Uh, it just reminds me of the school thing, show and tell. Did anyone do show and tell, bring in their bunny, bunny rabbit and show it to everybody and explain it? Well, it's a bit like that. We show by example and we tell God stories, we tell explanations. And finally, there is generational investment. Are we investing in the next generation? And what are we investing in the next generation? So we've talked a little about investing prayer, love, time in our biological children. We can also invest in children within our community. There's an African saying is it takes a village to raise a child. We can have some input into the children in our community. But we can also be investing in spiritual children. That is people younger in the faith than ourselves. Now, all of us, if we've been Christians a while, there are people who, they're not necessarily biologically younger, but they're younger in the faith than ourselves. So, are we passing the baton from one generation to another? Are we really doing that? Think of the people, now just quickly think, who invested in you when you were younger in the faith? Was it just the vicar, the minister, the pastor? Did you have people who invested in you? Because we need to invest in spiritual children. We need to be spiritual mothers and fathers to people who are younger and less experienced than ourselves. Helping people to know Jesus, not just the ways of Jesus, to know, have a relationship with Jesus. This is how Paul puts it in the Bible. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Sorry? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15 to 16. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Same passage, but this time from the message. I'm not writing all this as a neighborhood scold just to make you feel rotten. I'm writing as a father to you, my children. I love you, and I want you to grow up well, not spoiled. There are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong, but there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. Are you prepared to be a father? And the Bible doesn't miss out spiritual mothers. 1 Titus 2, verses 3 and 4. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women. So the Bible clearly says that they're also to be spiritual mothers. Older women in the faith or older women biologically helping younger women. So as spiritual fathers and mothers, we need to put the same investment into children, our spiritual children, as we've talked about biological children. We need to pray for them and with them. We need to love them, love them when they get it right and love them when they mess up and get it wrong. Did you mess up when you were a younger Christian? Did you do the wrong things? Did you say the wrong things? That was just, that, some people are nodding, good. We need to spend time with them, model and teach. We need to actually open up our home and, our, and family relationships to them so they can see what it means to live in relationship with Jesus. How do I treat my wife? How do I treat my children? Now look, this is a very difficult one because um, 
There are limits to this, I know, there are boundaries, because, you know, it's no good you spending all this time with your spiritual children and ignoring your biological children or ignoring your husband stroke wife. So, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you haven't got a, to get a balance. But the problem is that if we just meet people for once a fortnight in a coffee shop, that is a good start. I'm not knocking that. It's a good start, but it's not a good place to end. We ha there has to be more than that. And I have to point out to myself and to you that actually following Jesus does not come without cost. If you really want to, for people to see Jesus in you, they are not going to do that if they don't ever get exposed to your life. It's like doing life with people. Because if you look at some of the church relationships I've seen, where there are people who, who are looking after, say, ministers of the church and so on, but they only ever meet in a motorway coffee station once a month. They go, well, how's the church going? And the answer is, oh, it's going fine. But if they were to turn up to the church and speak to people in the church, they'd find that wasn't the case. And it's the same in our own lives. I can give you any old rubbish up here, can't I? But if you actually come and stay with us, you'll really see, won't you? Really see how we speak to each other, what happens when we fall out. Now, it's got to be a balance. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong, it's got to be a balance, but that is what it means to be spiritual mothers and fathers. It's got to mean something. Now, finally, finally, there is no such thing this side of heaven as perfect people, and therefore there's no such thing as perfect parents. Isn't that good? You can all relax. Do not be discouraged. You need to do your bit, and the Holy Spirit will do his bit. It's a partnership, except that the Holy Spirit does the heavy lifting. And the, the Bible has the last word. Have I not commanded you? This is from Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Shall we pray? Our Lord Jesus, we started this today by talking about speaking a word of parenthood over people, how we can be better biological parents, how we can be better parents in the widest sense if we're grandparents or we're brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever, but also, Lord, how we, how we can be spiritual parents, spiritual mothers and fathers. Lord, I pray that anything that I've said or Andrew said today that is not of you, Lord, we just pray it blows away like dust in the wind. But Lord, if there's anything that you're putting your finger on, I pray that, Lord, we would respond. I pray that we would hear your words and we would put them into action in our lives. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, um, as we, what happens now, some of the musicians come back, do they all? Yeah. Um, as the musicians come back, um, it may be that you would like to respond to something that's been said. It may be that you don't really have a relationship with Jesus and you would like to know more. Well, come down and let's talk about it. It may be that in some way that you feel that, you know, there's some, some challenge that you could sort of set a, a vision for your, your family in, a, in an intentional way that, that you, so far you don't feel has really happened and you want to sort of say, God, hey, God, I want to start again on this one. Or it may be that you want to actually think, how can God, how can I be a spiritual mother or a spiritual father to somebody? Lord, give me that opportunity. This week, give me that opportunity. And it may be you want to come and you want to say, God, I'm here, I'm available. What does this look like? And if any of those things apply to you, or indeed if you want prayer for healing or anything else, um, you know, come down the front, there'll be people who'll pray for you. Thank you.